It's Easter 2019, and the Channel Tunnel is gearing up for a double whammy. The tunnel's 25th birthday, and Brexit. It's an historic moment for this iconic landmark. The perfect time to go behind the scenes and beneath the seabed to sample a rich slice of the Franco-British teamwork that runs right through the longest undersea tunnel in the world. You can come again, did <laughs> is regarding the English Channel with renewed interest. That tunnel is again in the public eye. This is how the French see it, a comparatively simple engineering job, boring from each side to meet somewhere about the middle, the cost about 130 million pounds. As the overall traffic will be greatly increased if we go into the common market, the airlines will benefit as well. Paris will seem like our hometown. Crossing the Channel will seem like a run up the M1 or going Pullman to Brighton. As a barrier, it will handicap us no more. Hey, bonjour. Well done. I know, I've been practicing that all week. <laughs> the Channel Tunnel links two great friends and rivals, Britain and France. And it's been ferrying cars and lorries and people between those two countries for a quarter of a century. I tell you what, they need a bit of a bath. 25 years now. 20, 25 years of soot on them. <laughs> the tunnel is run by a bi-national company called Eurotunnel, which oversees up to 400 undersea train journeys every day along two railway lines that run for 24 miles beneath the English Channel, making it the busiest giant train set in the world. It's like going on a spaceship. Is that being a car wash? <laughs> it is a bit. That is what it is. Do you know what would be really cool though? Is if it actually was a car wash, they just washed everyone's car. <laughs> being a two country company, Eurotunnel does everything at the double. So the two tunnels link two terminals. There are teams of de at both ends. Smashed it. And two types of passenger too tourists and truckers. Normally, they don't mix, but today is different because changes at the check-ins in preparation for Brexit are causing considerable cone fusion. Oh, no. Oh, no, please. Oh, dear. Oh, they're all doing it now. Oh, they're all following. Oh, yeah, no. Hello, you are right? Yeah, we're just following the wrong day. Yeah, no worries. Give me one quick second. Bamboozled by the road cones and temporary signs, car drivers are following truckers into lorry lanes. So at the freight front desk, Liam Staveley and Anne Stone have double trouble. You can't actually check in here because this is the freight um, department. I'll tell them where to go. And Liam is in and out of the office like a fiddler's elbow. You see where the vans are going? Whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Running across an open road. Hello, you're right. Stick to the right, and someone up there will process your ticket. You'll be joined up at check in. We're there to help the customers. Doesn't matter if they're freight or tourists, we'll be uh, we're there making everything hashtag simply better, as we call it. By contrast, at the actual tourist check in, things are flowing so well, passenger leader Gary Churchyard has time to enjoy the car show. That's my favourite car, as Jeremy Clarkson would say. Jags! Huh? This is Charlie, we call him Charlie Longlegs. The only worry here is for Charlie the Beagle, <laughs> not being allowed back home after his holidays if there's an April no deal Brexit. No deal, and then he won't be coming home, will you, Charlie? <laughs> no worries, bye bye. With the last of the levers passing through and no more remainers, Liam can recharge his batteries with a typical British snack microwaved chicken madras. What else do we do on our breaks? Instagram, Snapchat? Yeah. The usual. Talk to the girlfriend. Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> <laughs> on the other side of the freight check-in, freight leader Lily Toms is on duty today, 
keeping truckers in line on their way to the trains. But one lorry has already collided with the all-new Brexit pit stop, and another has arrived with a ripped roof. This one here, it goes all, this, all the way across, oh, well. and you've got all this material as well, so even on a breeder, yeah, it's gonna it can take turn right. backwards. I'll take a picture of it and show him. A truck with a tear spells big trouble on a train in a tunnel, because at 140 kilometres an hour, a ripped tarpaulin can catch on the catenary. The overhead power lines fizzing with 25,000 volts. Bring these down in the tunnel and everything stops. So a lorry with a torn roof has to catch the ferry. I like to make sure all my customers can travel, um, but unfortunately, if I did let him travel, and unfortunately if that then did rip off, it can cause huge damage to the, um, to the tunnel itself, and then you don't want to talk about what could happen. <laughs> let me show you. This on your roof, so you can't travel with us. Can you pay this? No. Lily escorts the truck back to the motorway, while the rest of the trucks carry on loading. Once lorries have driven onto a train, they need to stop and stay stopped. So every lorry gets its wheels chocked to make sure the trucks don't move when the train does. And Lily has to check that the chockwork runs like clockwork. Yeah, the guy's got 26 minutes from when the train arrives to get it unchocked, offloaded, get it loaded again, and then chock it all again. So I've only got 26 minutes, so I don't have much time to breathe, I'm afraid, in that job. Feeling hot? Feeling hot? I'm boiling me, mate. Yeah. Sweating out. Wow. Not used to it. He loves it, yeah. After 25 years of practice, it's hard to chock better than a channel tunnel chocker. It's their responsibility to make sure the driver's got out of the cab right, and they won't proceed past that lorry until they have seen the driver physically get out and on the platform. How you doing, you all right? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. okay. Good. Yeah, Enjoy right. this English weather. Yeah. Unlike truckers, tourists stay with their vehicles in the enclosed passenger shuttles which isn't always a good thing. Is it that toilet or is that you? <laughs> Somebody ponked off. <laughs> oh, he needs to go and see a doctor. But on freight shuttles, it's different. Truckers leave their trucks and catch a bus. It sounds an odd thing to do, but it's 800 metres from the back of the shuttle to the trucker's club car at the front. After 26 chock-a-block minutes, the shuttle sets off into the North Tunnel on its 35-minute journey to France. At the controls is Tash Speed, one of Eurotunnel's newest recruits. The train's headlights give her the best possible view of the tunnel, and the truckers in the club car never see what she sees dark patches of seawater on the curved concrete walls, a sign that the tunnel leaks. When I found out the tunnel was designed to leak, that was, um, I found that quite worrying, but actually that's natural and that's actually what's been designed for the tunnel. There are pits for the water to drain into, so you will sometimes see wet patches in the tunnel. Um, but yeah, when I was first told that, I did think, oh dear. <laughs> It's the weekend, and maintenance teams are getting ready to go to work under the sea. Tonight, the catenary team is going to replace some overhead cables in the wet area of the tunnel on the English side of the channel. But before they can send their works trains into the tunnel, the section they'll be working in needs to be clear of running trains. So the team in the rail control center needs to open the crossover doors. This room is Eurotunnel's mission control, and its huge wall shows why two tunnels are better than one. The ability to switch trains between tunnels creates a train-free track 
where maintenance teams can do their work. For trains to switch tunnels, the tracks need to cross over. There are two crossover points in the channel tunnel system, about a third of the way from the coast at either end and 35 metres beneath the seabed. They divide the running tunnels into six sections. Tonight, the catenary team will be here in the wet area in the north tunnel. So to keep that section free of high-speed electric trains, it's time to open the doors at the UK crossover. The two doors weigh 94 tonnes each. It takes almost four minutes to open them. Revealing a vast undersea cathedral as high as a stack of three double-decker buses. Now, all passenger and freight services can bypass the wet section in the North Tunnel, so the works trains can set off from the maintenance yard. But before the catenary team can follow them, they need to walk to the tunnel entrance and turn off the 25,000 volts in the cables they'll be touching. There. Mark Cornwall is the leader of the catenary team. So if you watch out for trains behind us. <laughs> Most people call him Buzz. Hey. Yeah. And he's been working on the electrified cables here since day one. Give it a dodgy top to you. And so has Mick Phillips. Come with that dodgy, it's just blinded me. Hello. With the power off, their next task is to link the earth cable to the feed cable. This will stop any electrical current from surging down the line into the tunnel. The red light on the track tells train drivers to stop here. And the blue lights show where the catenary goes from live to dead. Now it's safe to go to work in the tunnel, as long as they can get past the venomous snakes. It scared the living daylights out of me when I saw it. One of Mark's colleagues caught this snake on camera, slinking under the track to its secret den. The screen will go blank in a bit because it had started to turn on him, so he actually started doing a bit of a runner. <laughs> For Mark, the thought of being bitten by an adder is more shocking than 25,000 volts. Oh, mate, that's scary. I would take on electricity all day rather than adders. Safely past the slithery gatekeepers and into the service tunnel, Mark's team has a six-mile drive under the sea to the wet area, a section that causes more problems than anywhere else in the tunnel. Now they can travel down the tunnel on their diesel-powered works train and find the section of cable they need to replace. It's hot and sticky down here. The temperature is about 25 degrees, and the places where seawater leaks through are easy to see. Because it's salt water, it eats away at everything. This is where it drips straight in. It damages the wire a lot. No other tunnel in the world has conditions quite like this. It's always a learning curve, especially in this tunnel, because no one's ever built a tunnel like this before. Water damage means catenary wire has to be changed every three years here, instead of every eight years, as it is in the rest of the tunnel. Tonight, Mark's team is replacing two wires, a balance weight wire and a flying tail wire. The flying tail holds the electrified catenary cables at just the right height for trains to draw the power they need. The balance weight puts four tons of tension into a flying tail. So first job tonight is to take the strain. So basically, once they've got all the weight off it, they can remove the balance weight wire and the flying tail wire and replace the whole lot. The flying tail is 11 metres long, but it holds up more than 1,000 metres of catenary. So the pull lifts and slings need to be strong enough to do exactly the same job while the wires are replaced. As the weight's coming up, all the weight's coming off the flying tail. Now they can release the flying tail, the pull lifts 
has got hold of the balance weights and this pool lift has got hold of the flying tail. So you've got the slings here that take in all the weight. As the clock ticks by, Sunday turns into Bank Holiday Monday. It's now the 6th of May, the Channel Tunnel's 25th birthday. We're actually in the tunnel 25 years to the day, and it's actually just gone midnight, so we are 25 years in now, exactly. It's a big moment for Mark and his Yorkshire mate Mick. They both worked on building this seventh wonder of the modern world, so between them have more than 50 years Channel Tunnel know-how under their hard hats. Oh, the wheels up for us, somebody. We're like brothers. He's just a northern, northern brother I never had. <laughs> Working side by side, these tunnel twins are another example of how two-person teamwork no. keeps the tunnel ticking. If everybody's done the job properly, this should just fit together nicely. Perfect. There you go. All Mick has to do now is check the 1100 millimetre gap between the wheels for the balance weight wire. Have you noticed you don't show us the tape, though? I'll show you the tape, you don't believe me. Are you ready? Is it 11, yeah. 1100? 1100, there you go. What does it say on the wall? It's exactly what it needs to be, so Mick should look happy. Mick never looks happy. I'm always happy. Oh, he's always happy. But what if it's not quite right? If it's not quite right, it'll be on the floor in the morning. The first train will take it back down that way. So we'll be back in here for another 15, 16 hours, not just eight hours we've been in here tonight. Their work is done. And just a few hours later, the first high-speed trains are heading through the North Tunnel to France. So Mark and Mick can rest easy. And down at Folkestone Harbour, the bank holiday tourists are oblivious to all the work that went on under the sea last night. And the passengers on the shuttles below have much more important things to talk about. Joshy, keep an eye out the window for the fishes. Yes, They should have put in um, windows all the way along. Oh, <laughs> It's going to be dark. It's going to be in a tunnel. We must be coming close because um, we're slowing down. Yeah. yeah. Well, Here we go. Hey, we're in front. Look, look, I'm in front. To mark the Channel Tunnel's birthday, there's a group of British rappers inside the world's biggest train shed at the Calais Terminal. The shed is so large, French technicians use bicycles to get around. But all John Pickthorne and the rappers need is a stage as they transform an ordinary passenger shuttle into a 25th anniversary special edition. It is just like a giant wallpapering job, yeah. It's um, obviously on a massive scale. Um, and obviously, the, uh, you just can't get anything wrong at all. Because once the first panel goes on, that decides where everything else goes. The idea is to show the changing landmarks as you travel from the UK to continental Europe. It was designed by an A-level student in Kent as part of a competition to mark the tunnel's quarter century. The carriage has gone from sooty tunnel grey to sparkly tunnel blue. So events manager Deborah Elliott is hoping for smiley faces all round. I think our customer's absolutely going to love it, be it the little dog that's poking its head round the corner or, you know, the London telephone box. is something different every time. Talking of a little dog poking its head round the corner, at the Calais Pet drive through there's a four-legged frenzy of vaccination and pet passport checks. Wabby's vaccination is OK. You've, you've done it, so it's OK. Around 1,000 pets a day pass through the Channel Tunnel, okay. so this is just another day for Fabienne Benard at the pet desk. He wants to say hello. <laughs> or is it? Because it's time to say bonjour to Maurice. Maurice. <laughs> Maurice travels with Eurotunnel every five weeks, dividing his time between his London pad and his place in the south of France. Oh, he's so nice. So cute. Yeah. Passport checked and cleared for travel, Maurice is off for some French petisserie to take back to England. Down on the Calais platforms, Tash Speed and Steve Clark are preparing for their next freight shuttle mission. 
This Eurotunnel double act is also known as Two Stop Tash and Too Tall Steve, because Tash often stops twice when pulling into a platform, and Six Foot Seven Steve bangs his head on more or less everything. He actually rang me up the other day and he said, found someone else to hit my head on. I said, oh, what would that be? And he had to describe where it was. And I said, oh, bless you. Found pretty much everything. To hit your head yeah. on. I've got many a dent because <laughs> of that. <laughs> but, you know, you, you learn to, you adapt. Tash and Steve have dual roles. While one drives, the other acts as chef de train in the club car. So with Tash at the controls for this mission, Steve is on guard duty, looking after the truckers and keeping Tash up to speed with everything she needs to know. Just bring in for the status, please. Right, so status is 3-42-00, and you've got dangerous goods on the rear rake uh, on 6, wagon 6. Goods. 6 on the rear rake, 3 42 zero, zero. So that's the status. Can you it's given to the driver just to let them know obviously how many passengers are in the back and if there's anyone actually on the rear rakes or the rear loco uh, just for any uh, reason we have to stop or there's an evacuation. Dangerous goods can be anything that could cause a hazard inside the tunnel from radioactive materials to ingredients for fizzy drinks but today the main hazard in the club car is heat. In a sealed container whizzing down a hot tunnel Steve and his truckers need to keep cool, but the air conditioning is playing up. Turn the old computer off and turn it back on again. It's working again, so we're good. We're all right. Clearly, it's not working. Steve has definitely drawn the short straw on this mission, because up front in the cab, the air conditioning is working fine, and Tash is super cool. Yeah, I loved it when I first got to toot the horn. Makes you feel like a real train driver. It's another freight shuttle mission accomplished for Tash and Steve, and just in time for lunch. I spy with my little eye something beginning with... D. Donut. No, we ate those on the way out. You don't want one of these? No. <laughs> Meanwhile, up in the terminal control centre, the traffic allocation team is having its weight-watching willpower severely tested by passenger allocator Didier Burdin and his naughty box of French cakes. Uh, this one is called Calais. It's a speciality of the town of Calais. Didier normally works at the Calais terminal. Yes, because what risks to happen is that there risks to have complications. But once a month, he commutes for a day at work on the Folkestone side, and he always brings a taste of France with him. Keeps calling me. Have you got a bib? In France, we're used to it. Here, it is different. Like a custard underneath, it's broad. People are really enjoying this. The French cakes are inhaled in seconds, so Didier can get on with the passenger allocations for tourists in cars. Romeo 3, Foxton traffic. Are you ready to send the vehicles to the, through the chicane to the single deck, please? Yeah. While Alison Fair handles the freight traffic. All right, then. Cheers, Ray. Down on the platforms, it's another busy shift for freight leader Lily, because a lorry has just driven into a train. So we've had a HGV hit um, the side of the train. Um, it's quite important, this part, because it could be the fire detection equipment. Um, so we've just got to get some troubleshooters down to have a look and see if we can fix it and see if the train's safe to travel. This is Lily. Troubleshooter. Troublemaker. They're filming, Dave. I know. The lorry has bent a bolt on the side of the locomotive and loosened the brake unit. Dave's suggestion that a blob of glue might sort it is ignored by the French troubleshooters. They say it needs a bit more je ne sais quoi. So we've got a recirculation because they won't send it because there's too much problems with the brakes from that oh, lorry hitting it. So if we want to get in the car, we'll go around and um, take these vehicles off. Allocation. A recirculation needs organisation, and that's a job for the allocation team at the terminal control centre. Oh, I'm glad I've got the cake eaten out of the way. It should be simple to recirculate 32 lorries. You just unload them from the broken train and lead them round to another train on a different platform. Trouble is, like buses, you wait ages for a recirculation 
and two come along at once. Neil, I've got to hold that because I've also got a recirculation of 6434, uh, which has got 107 vehicles on, on the tourist train. We've got a passenger and a freight. <laughs> With more people on the passenger shuttles, the tourists take priority. So the truckers have to hold their horses while the cars are recirculated. This kind of thing requires quick thinking from the passenger allocators and an ability for Frenchman Didier to master maths in his second language. Six, five, six, four, uh, three, uh, five, zero. But for Lily today, Problems don't just come in twos. Hello, Freida. And things are about to go from bad to Zutelor. Who's that? Because on top of the two recirculations, there's a third problem coming down the track. This is turning into a great day. One of Lily's team has just sounded the orange button alarm. There's a lorry on a departing freight train with a rip in its roof. People watching the trains out have spotted something, an anomaly. I can't say that word very well, an anomaly. Um, so his orange button's on his radio, so they will stop the train. OK, are you dealing with that research? Yeah, and the train stops on six now. Oh, God, right. OK, I'm with the one that's unloading on uh, ten at the moment. It's organised chaos. But the good news is that the passenger service is back on track. So at last, Lily can get the trucks from the damaged train recirculated. Oh, Lily, you can go now. Lovely, thank you. With the lorries back in the allocation lanes for the next shuttle to France, Lily takes a look at the repair work on the broken freight engine. There you go. <laughs> it's a temporary blue belt and braces solution. But the rear locomotive's brake unit is now secure enough to return to the maintenance shed in Calais. Franco-British cooperation has done it again. We work together and we don't ask any questions about uh, uh, French or English. And, uh, the difference makes the strength. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah, I, I like it. With calm restored on the platforms, the time has come to reveal the 25th anniversary train. To 18-year-old designer, Reese Evans. You don't know you are, well, Mum's proud of you. Really, I am. I am and his extremely chuffed mum. Thank you. For Reese and fellow designer Odessa, this is a big moment. I photoshopped it onto the side of the train. Yeah, so did I. As with all masterpieces, this creation is whatever the viewer wants it to be. It's supposed to be Dover Castle, so They it's... said Tower of London. <laughs> Amazing piece, though. I like it. So this work of art is ready to depart. And Didier is ready to go home too. But he's already planning next month's visit when he's decided to spring a surprise on his cake-loving British colleagues. Because they are used to good cakes now, they know when I come here, but they're going to have some. So I said, next time I bring cheese. <laughs> so it's au revoir, Didier. And until the fromage, bon voyage. <laughs>